seated. Today's a special day, a sad day in our church life as we bid farewell to Justin and Bryn uh, today on their last Sunday. And several had asked me, and it was already a good idea, but I asked Bryn if she would uh, sing with us here today. Oops, um, I forgot to get the title, so there we go. Thank you, Nick. So anyway, go ahead, Bryn. you make me laugh and yet I feel like it's okay to cry with you something about just being with you when I leave I feel like I've been near God and that's the way it ought to be yeah cause you've been more than a friend to me you fight off my enemies cause you've spoken the truth over my Bring me a brand new song. When I didn't think I could find the strength to sing, and all the while I'm hoping that I'll do the kind of praying for you that you've done for me. And that's the way it ought to be. You've been more than a friend to me. Every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless. Cause you've been more than a friend to me You fight off my enemies Cause you've spoken the truth over my life And you'll never know what it means to me Just to know you've been on your knees for me How you bless my life More than you'll ever know More than you'll ever know Yeah, yeah, yeah More than you'll ever know I apologize. Thank you, Brynn. That was tough. She did good. We are going to miss uh, both of them, and I'll just say we've, we've teased Justin that, you know, it's, it's like most of us with our wives, you know, it, but we're really going to miss Brynn. Um, <laughs> and I know in the choir, at least at our music ministry, we're, we're for sure going to miss uh, um, her. Well, let's uh, join together as we continue singing the great song, We Will Remember, the Lord's faithfulness day after day. He is faithful and good to us. Let's uh, rejoice and worship together. Would you like to stand? Let's sing together. Thank you. 
Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you this morning, Father, and lift up our hearts and our voices in praise of you, Father. Father, we do indeed love you, Father, and we do indeed praise you this morning, Father. And with all of our hearts and with all of our souls, Father, all of our mind and all of our strength, may we honor you this morning, Holy Father. Father, may your glory fill this place this morning. And Father, as Moses asked, Lord, show us your glory. Father God, what an honor and privilege to come into your house this morning, Father. Thank you for all of these that have gathered today, Father. 
Father, in this moment, God, we just turn our hearts towards you, Father. And God, we cry out, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Father God, the apostles said that you have the words of life. And it's so true, and we need those words this morning, Father. Father, there are many in need this morning, Father. There are many hurting this morning, many that are ill this morning, God. And we desperately need you, Father. Father, I pray, uh, Lord, for Dr. Cook. Father, I thank you uh, for him, Lord, and his ministry to your people here at Taylor's Valley. God, thank you for him and use continue to use him in a mighty way. God, may your anointing be upon him, Father, as he prepares to bring your word to us this morning, Father. God, if there's anyone in your house this morning, Lord, that doesn't know you as Savior, Father, today, may today be the day of their salvation. May they know your love today, Father. Father God, as we come to this time in this service where we give back to you, Father, I pray that you would take these gifts and that you would bless them and that you would use them, Father, for your glory. Father, use the people of Taylor's Valley to make a difference for the kingdom here in this community. Father, use the people of Taylor's Valley for your glory. Father, I continue to pray, Lord, for the pastor search committee as they search for your next man at this church, Father. God, I pray for discernment on their parts, God, that you would give them wisdom and bring that right candidate to them. And Father, we pray for the next shepherd, Father, of this church. God, right now you are working in his heart, preparing him to come to this place. You're preparing his family, Father. We pray for them as well. God, I, I cannot wait to hear of all of the great things in the days ahead that you're doing at Taylor's Valley. God, we praise you for the work that you've been doing here, Father, and we anticipate, anticipate greater things uh, in the days to come, Father, that indeed this, this body, God, would grow, Father. Um, that is your word for us, Lord, is to grow, Father. So thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for the honor and privilege to be your child. Now speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen.
Would you turn with me to Psalm 51? This is a psalm uh, about the heart. Why do Christians sing songs like what we just heard? With all my heart, I want to love you, Lord. Uh, that may sound like a very elemental question to persons of faith. You may wonder if you're not a person of faith about such a question. Um, when Jesus Christ comes in and moves into a person's heart, that individual begins to develop their capacities uh, for loving God and loving others that just aren't naturally there. And the desire to have a heart filled with love for God and for others grows uh, the longer that somebody knows Jesus. Once we meet him, uh, we have a new understanding and new capacities. Uh, we're talking about the heart today uh, on Valentine's Day. and What a very significant, essential topic of faith uh, for those of us who seek God, know God, want to follow God, want to love God. Psalm 51 is famous among Bible students uh, because we know by the indication of textual notes that uh, this is a psalm that was written by King David after he made a huge mistake, the biggest mistake of his life, which led to other mistakes, uh, compounded mistakes. And David, once he was confronted by Nathan uh, for his unfaithfulness with another man's wife, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, uh, once he was confronted, came to an awareness that something huge had to happen uh, from the inside in his heart. And David wrote this psalm. Let's read the first 13 verses of this psalm, Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, meaning more than anyone, exceedingly, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold. You desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify or purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Well, we all have a heart problem. Uh, we all have a heart problem. Uh, our hearts are the most dangerous part of who we are. Our hearts have the greatest capacities for what God has in store with us, for us. I think we all know we're not talking about the physical organ, although that uh, physical organ uh, that pumps the blood and sends the oxygen and nutrition throughout our body and helps to uh, bring life to us is so essential. There are people in this room, when I say we all have a heart problem, that would have said essentially, well, I've got one. I don't know about the rest of you because some people do. It's something that, thanks be to God, we're getting more help for for those of us who have a little bit of trouble with the heart. But we're talking about that control center within us where God does his greatest work, where we have our greatest capacities come together. We're talking not so much physiologically as holistically, the 
there is that within us, that place within us, that portion of us where God can move and begin to make a new person of us. The heart's important to God. 1 Samuel 16, 7, in a message directly from God to Samuel, the word of God actually spoken to Samuel says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God is focused and looking on our hearts. He's concerned about the heart. We will all go as our heart goes. Do you believe that? Uh, we're going to go where our heart leads us to go, where that which is in control of us uh, leads us and moves us and drives the passions that sends us. Uh, your heart will take you to the right persons or to the wrong persons. That's a pretty big deal. Those who give testimony of having lived their lives among the wrong kind of people have quite a testimony to tell. The heart will lead you to the right persons in all significant levels of your life or to the wrong persons. Your heart will lead you to certain allegiances. It will lead you to the right allegiances, those things, those people, those, uh, those movements in life that deserve your allegiance. Or your heart will lead you to the wrong passions and to serving things that will actually end up destroying you. And so your heart leads to the right allegiances or to the wrong allegiances and passions. Your heart will allow you to be devoted primarily to yourself if your heart is closed. If your heart is closed, you are closed in upon yourself. It's a universal problem in humanity. And to be closed in upon yourself, you're going to be seeking things and trying to find things that you cannot find. Or your heart will be open to God and to others. So where your heart leads you is where your life will go. David found that out the hard way. He'd sent Joab and the troops off to fight a battle. He was on the rooftop. He looked down and he saw a beautiful woman. He called her to his house. He had an affair. He committed adultery. He ended up compounding the problem by calling the husband back, hoping that maybe the husband and wife could uh, get the relationship going again. And this faithful soldier, Uriah, wouldn't even go see his wife because the soldiers were still in battle. He slept with the troops. David ended up sending him out to the front lines to have him killed. There's not a bigger low-life scoundrel in Scripture than King David. This, this is a paradox for those of us who love the Scriptures. And he was a complicated, paradoxical figure because he was also a man after God's own heart. And had God not done a work in his heart, had God not forgiven David, he would be known forever as only a low-life scoundrel. I don't fully understand why God spends so much time on scoundrels. I'm understanding it a little better. You know, I didn't come into this life, and my daddy didn't teach me, I want you to go out and be the biggest scoundrel that you can. I was raised by godly people, and we had a different model and different desires, and and so it's kind of been a struggle for me that God spends so much time on scoundrels. But I've come to a point in my life that praise be to God that he spends his time on scoundrels. Because if God could get David back, if God could change David's heart, he can change anyone and anybody's heart. Is that not a great hope that we have in God through Jesus Christ? And so David was confronted, and he came to this awareness that if God didn't forgive him and clean his heart, he was lost, hopeless. And out of that 
journey of seeking God and coming to understand the depth of God's forgiveness and cleansing, we have this wonderful song from one who's been there needing to be cleansed. And it illustrates some things for all of us because we've all got some degree of a heart problem. First of all, a heart withheld from God is our number one problem. Commentators really do do all kinds of convoluted things and and some helpful things with verse 4. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, a surface reading of that text, when you know David's story, you're going to immediately step back and say, you know, there's, I just don't know about that. Against you, you only, have I sinned. My goodness, David. You've got a lot of splaining to do, and you've got a lot of amending to do, and you had a man killed. The Hebrew construction is helpful here because uh, the uh, syntax of this verse allows us to read this, against you, before all, above all, I have sinned. Uh, That's how I read that text, and uh, do the study of the words and the syntax. And that's true. You can't really make amends and find forgiveness and find reconciliation on any other level until you have it with God. Until then, you are still cooperating with the evil that led you to those evil deeds in the first place. In fact, David uses that language, against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. My definition, my functional definition of evil is that when we cooperate with things that, uh, with destructive forces, destroying things that are precious to God. When we are cooperating with destructive forces that are destroying things that are precious to God, we are accommodating to and participating with evil. I don't think that necessarily means that uh, all those who do such a thing are uh, totally possessed by evil. I think folks with a lot of good in their life can participate and do evil things, and I believe that's what David did. And he began to destroy what was precious to God. In fact, the destruction had such a ripple effect, it affected him the rest of his life. One of the saddest moments in Scripture is that out of this experience and out of this betrayal of his family and a pattern of betrayal that David never got over toward the end of his life, he gets run out of town by his own son, Absalom. You know, David never got over the ripple effects of what he did. But I do believe David made his peace from God. He knew that if he had a heart given to anything other than God, he didn't have a chance. So let's talk about you and me. You know, we're living in a crazy season of life. I don't know when I've ever been more concerned about politics. I don't know about you, and this isn't a political sermon. I'm just confessing my confusion. I don't know when I've ever been more bewildered about the solutions for our culture. You know, almost every time I began to think about that, God calls me back to the one thing that I can do something about, and that's me. And that's us. I do know that when God changes my heart and when God calls a group of people together and he changes their hearts and that group of people begins to work in the world, it becomes transformative to people in this world. And that is the hope of God for this earth is how God will work through the hearts of people and by his Holy Spirit. So let's talk about us for a minute and the control center of our life. Who is in control? Is it God in control of your heart this morning? Now, I I know, you know, folks, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ lives in my life, and the Lord Jesus Christ is at work in my heart. But I have a capacity to still stiff-arm Jesus and do just as jolly well as I please. That's one of the disturbing things of this journey. It's mainly a disturbance about me. But when God is at work and in control of our hearts, he's leading us to what is good and to pure and to whole. And please listen today, if you, especially if you've got a heart struggle going on. If God is in control, he 
leads us to the right people. You know, I have made, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. But I, I don't, this, this is more of a, a confession and a statement of testimony to the sovereignty of God than anything else. All along the way, God has led my life to be among the right people. And that is a gift of God's sovereignty and grace. Now, I know some wonderful people whose testimony is otherwise. And I say that not to seem better than anybody, because that's certainly not the fact. If I had to confess my sins before you, I would be just as ashamed as all of you are to have to confess publicly uh, my sins, because they're very real. But I know that when God is in control of the human heart, that God leads us to the right people. When God is in control of our life, we have the right passions for things beautiful and whole and pure and good. When God is in control of our hearts, we live out the right practices. So when we're talking about us, if you can resonate with that, be thankful to God and testify that because you have asked Christ to come in and do a work in your life and in your heart, that you can see the evidence of his work in your heart and in your life. Or on the other hand, is your heart still seeking its own desires and satisfactions, leading you to the wrong people over and again. I, you know, Facebook has some downsides, and I'm still scared to death, death of it, but it's put me in touch with a lot of old friends, and just before Christmas, I got in touch with a, an old high school friend named Bob, and uh, he was somebody who had known the Lord. I went to high school with many people in California who were not professing persons of faith. He happened to be one who was... And he literally said this to me. He said, uh, Ron, I went and met a girl and got married and instantly knew I'd married the wrong person. Can you imagine that feeling? And he told me a story of 30 years being among the wrong people, doing the wrong thing. That, that one step, it's just remarkable and astonishing to me that people have such stories. But I'll tell you what, if the Lord is not in control of your heart, you will be seeking your own satisfactions that may lead to the wrong people, the wrong passions, and the wrong practices. After our family moved to California, we had a youth minister that took great risk, and he did something really controversial. In fact, we had more than one business meeting about this uh, controversial thing. And I'll, I'll say to Matt and Justin, you know, we've got to watch our choices that we make. But he... Uh, arbitrarily decided he was going to load up our youth group and take us to Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Now, doesn't that sound risky? From conservative Orange County, California, and you couldn't get more conservative when I was growing up than Orange County, to Sunset Strip, about 35 minutes away. Well, we really didn't know what we were going to, but we unloaded and we went down to this storefront and there was this wild and crazy guy in charge of all the activities in there and he was a man whose name some of you will recognize. His name was Arthur Blessed. Arthur had been known at that time as a youth evangelist and subsequently he's the man who would carry the cross all across the world, back and forth. I mean, some of you have, may know about Arthur Blessed. Wonderful heart for the Lord Jesus. About half crazy, but wonderful heart for the, you know, some people, uh, I say that in a real benevolent way. You know, some of the greatest risk takers seem to us just to be a little bit different than he is. Arthur preached that night. He stopped in the middle of the service and he took an offering unlike anything I've ever seen. He said, okay, all of you who are using drugs and want to flush them down the toilet, follow me. And about 50 people, I didn't even know people use many drugs. By the way, my first thought was, where are the police around here when he's doing this? I mean, literally, 1964, and he's marching people down an aisle, and they're flushing drugs down the toilet. After it was over, after several people had come to Christ, he talked to us as youth, and he said, everything wrong in this world is right around the corner from this place. It's easy to find. Well, I'm here to tell you everything and wrong in this world is not that far from Taylor's Valley Baptist Church. For somebody who is driven to seek their own satisfaction, 
Secondly, an unclean heart has no room for God. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 13 have been intriguing to me for a long time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a real quick unpacking of some of that right now. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, to understand that this reveals for us through the genius of God and through the captivating experience of King David who began to understand great things about God, uh, what an unclean heart yields. If you look at the opposite of what you're reading in this text, first of all, create in me a clean heart, O God. David knew what a filthy, dirty heart felt like. You take these statements and you look on the other side and you realize what he's coming out of. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. David was a man who understood tumultuous emotions. In fact, one of the interesting studies of David's life were the moments in his life when he was going through periods of turmoil. But here, to have the emotions and to have the spirit within so in a spin and so in turmoil, just wishing somebody would come and settle it. Do not cast me away from your presence. Can you imagine living, knowing that God is right out there and yet not coming near? The same thing. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit there and not at work in you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. One of the things that puzzles me the most about contemporary Christianity. And I, I want to say this carefully because I have a deep sense of compassion and empathy for the struggles of life and for those who go through times of discouragement and people who struggle with depression. I'm not targeting that as I say what I'm about to say, and I'm thankful for those of you who have found the help of God in others uh, and the help of medical science in dealing with those things. But I'm puzzled that we're living in an era in which there are so many unhappy Christians. We live in an era in which there are a lot of unhappy pastors. Uh, Maryland and search committee, as you look for a pastor, I, I can already tell you're looking for all the right things. And somebody said, uh, Ron, what one thing would you say to the committee? Uh, if you could say to them, and I would say, find somebody who's happy in the Lord and who is emotionally and relationally happy in the Holy Spirit. We live in unhappy times. David knew what it was like to have his joy completely gone. Can you imagine living every day and year of your life as a sad person? Again, I'm not talking about the struggles that some people have with discouragement and depression, but just the loss of any understanding of joy. And sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I'll be able to make a difference in somebody's life. I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. It's an unusual kind of torment to want God to be at work in your life and yet something within you is keeping him right out there. That is an unusual kind of torment and struggle. That God is right there, right out there, why in the world can I not know? Only when a heart is broken open, only when somebody comes to God with a yielding and open spirit can God do a work of cleansing and wholeness and fill a heart with what God wants to fill our hearts with. We can't do it. We can't do a work of the renovation and the change of our hearts. Only God can do that. But David is speaking of an experience in which he knows once he comes to God, confessing his great need and opens his life to him, that God can come in and change his life and actually create in him a clean heart. I think the big question for many of us at points in our life and for most people who don't know the Lord, are you ready to deal with your heart problem? and ready to realize that uh, you and the sin in your heart are closed in upon yourself, and that only God can cleanse and renovate and change. Well, I'm here to tell you, don't try to do that by yourself. 
My first embarrassing moment as a husband and father of three children, my first huge embarrassing moment. I've had several. If you've got kids, you're going to be embarrassed. But my first huge embarrassing moment was uh, when I was a young pastor. Uh, my wife and I had three children. I had uh, cooperated with her. Not only was I overloaded in my work, but I had cooperated and encouraged her to be overloaded. And uh, uh, my parents, for one time in their life, had driven across the West in their trailer, unbeknownst to us. And they said, you know, we're about five hours away. We'd like to come see you. And I just said, our house is a mess. We've got all kinds of problems. Uh, I'm overloaded, but come on. And my dad, in his gracious and kind voice, said, well, Ron, we'll sleep outside, but we can come in and help you with that. And they arrived and came in. And in about three or four hours, put the house in order. In three or four months, we hadn't put our house in order put our house in order. Uh, we had several problems with that house. Now, I, I, I can fix things beyond repair. Everything that I'd tied into in that house was a bigger mess than it was when I'd tied into it about four days my dad had fixed everything and then he sat me down and had a heart to heart talk my, my father was a wise man and a godly man he could say more in two sentences than anybody I've ever known he said one thing Ron you're trying to do too much And then he prayed with me that I would let God lead me. Not to do it my way, but to do it God's way. That's the human problem. For God to come in and put everything in order and clean everything up and lead us to learn to live his way and not just our way. Someone here this morning has never, ever done that. You have never opened your life to let the Lord Jesus come in and forgive you and cleanse you and begin to do a work in your heart. Well, on this Valentine's Day, it is right for Christians to say and to talk about love, and God loves you so much. God loves us all so much that he wants to come in and help us with our heart problem. Whatever yours is, let the Lord Jesus do his work today. Our hymn of invitation this morning is, Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's stand and sing, and you come as God leads you to come.